today uh, a designer, an author, and a professor of game design, a Robin Komen. And uh, she has focused on the power of games to prompt po positive social change, even as they serve an entertainment function. Robin is a regular speaker on the topic of game design with focuses on diversity, accessibility, game design for older adults, narrative design, game design education. And she's spoken on these subjects at conferences. Uh, in her talk, Diversity in the Game Industry, there will be a discussion of current and historic diversity issues in the game industry in the areas of gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and age. Uh, and so I very much welcome Robin to come up to the stage. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Jocelyn. So I'm just curious, how many of you consider yourself gamers? Ooh, look, I had more than I thought. How many of you play Words with Friends or Bejeweled or some kind of digital card game or Scrabble, right? And so even if you don't think of yourself as a gamer, you're probably somebody who plays games of some kind, whether it's a physical game or a digital game. And so I just want to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, sort of the way things have evolved in our industry. I find that people who don't perhaps uh, have a really strong attachment to games sometimes think of the industry as something that's just for kids, right? Something that's just sort of mindless entertainment. But games are actually a really important form of media. And like any other form of media, they impact the people that consume it. And so for me, you know, obviously I want the games that I create to be entertaining and engaging, but I also always in the back of my mind am thinking, what is the impact that the work that I create going to have on other people, right? How is it going to shape the way they think or the way that they feel? So I look forward to chatting with you a bit and having some great questions at the end here. So we'll hop right in. So basically what we're going to talk a little bit is about the current state of game products, just so you can get a little bit of an idea of how influential games have become. And then we'll talk a little bit about who's making games and who's playing games. You may not be super shocked to know <laughs> that like the game products themselves uh, are not incredibly diverse. The people that make games, sadly, are also not incredibly diverse. So we'll talk a little bit about the relationship there. And then I want to just take a step back and see kind of how long this has been going on. There are some really interesting trends and patterns that sadly haven't changed very much in the last 40 years. So then we'll take a look maybe at what's coming next and where our sources of change are in relationship to this particular form of entertainment. So in terms of state of the product, you may or may not be aware that in 2021, games were nearly a $200 billion industry. They have for probably about a decade now vastly outsold television, film, and music. And so there are more people all over the world playing games than ever before from all different age groups and backgrounds. When we look just at the U.S. alone, last year games sold over $60 billion with a B. <laughs> like, and so I think for folks who, again, who don't really know a lot about the industry, it's probably a surprising number. We don't perhaps think of games as having become so pervasive. So, you know, I, I bring up, right, that there are diversity issues, and I see a lot of nodding heads, so we probably all know that there are some issues in this industry. And I guess, to be fair, they're not isolated to games. You know, I, as was mentioned, I'm a, a teacher, I teach game design, and so when I talk to my students every time I have a new class, I always like to reinforce for them that sadly these are issues that exist in every form of entertainment. These are issues that exist in film and issues that exist in television and comic books, even in children's literature. And so we're not alone in this, but if we don't identify the fact that we have diversity issues, they're not going to get better. So some evidence of issues here. Um, so Gamergate was, I say was, I don't know if it's actually gone, we just don't really talk about it anymore, it was a, a pretty atrocious series of events that unfolded beginning in 2014, 
where in which several designers, female designers, queer designers, began to be targeted by what I would call a very toxic niche portion, not just of the audience, but even of members of the industry. And so we, for better or for worse, tend to have an audience that's pretty technically savvy. And so we ended up with several well-known cases of designers who actually had their home addresses, their phone numbers, their email addresses just released to the public, people receiving death threats that drove them from their homes. And basically just kind of this explosion of negativity toward games that were trying to make a difference, games that were trying to explore tougher issues like mental health, games that were trying to broaden not just the audience of consumers, but the audience of creators. Um, there are some tools out there if you're ever curious about trying to make a game yourself, like Twine, for example, which don't require you to be a programmer. They don't require the same, perhaps, level of technical proficiency in certain areas. And so a lot of this just stemmed around what is a game, right? What, what actually makes a game a game? And sadly, I think, you know, looking back on the vitriol that arose here and the, the homophobia and the sexism and the racism that was associated with Gamergate was really kind of a foreshadowing of things that were to come over the next few years. And so this wasn't obviously the first time that people in our industry were aware there was a problem. It was just the first time that perhaps it so dramatically had an impact on people's lives. And so in addition to that, you can see here a series of lawsuits have happened with some really big name studios over the last few years. If you're not familiar with Riot Games, they're probably the most well known for a game called League of Legends, which is um, it's called a MOBA, a massively multiplayer battle arena. And so Riot, like Ubisoft and Activision, suffered with diversity issues. They did a lot of gatekeeping, um, expecting, for example, people who applied for jobs to have attained a certain degree of proficiency and expertise in their game. If you weren't at a certain level of proficiency, if you weren't good enough at their game, they wouldn't even consider you as an employee. And so surprise, surprise, <laughs> they got a lot of people who act alike and thought alike who were from similar demographic backgrounds working for them, not creating the most positive work environment for people that didn't fit in that mindset. And so they ended up getting sued and ended up paying out quite a bit uh, in that lawsuit. Ubisoft basically had an identical problem. Lawsuits around hostile work environments, toxic work environments, where women and, and people of color and members of the LGBTQIA community just didn't feel made welcome or made a part of the team, uh, didn't have the same opportunities for advancement within the organization. And so the most recent was the Activision Blizzard, Blizzard suit. I believe this is the first time that we've actually seen a studio sued by the state. So the state <laughs> of California is actually suing Activision Blizzard for, yeah, you can clap. <laughs> This will be on YouTube. I am clapping. <laughs> because if this kind of thing doesn't happen, change doesn't happen. Right? And so it doesn't make me sad, of course. <laughs> I had students come in to my classroom whose dream was to work for Blizzard, who some of whom actually went on and had wonderful careers there. And then, you know, when all of this was unfolding, kind of had to look at who they were and what they were doing and decide if it was someplace they wanted to be. Um, when you look at, I guess, sort of the response of the, the workforce of Blizzard, you know, they, they staged a walkout with nearly 100% participation from the workforce at Blizzard. So I think there was you know, a positivity in that response. How much has changed since then, I, I think, is still up for debate. Um, change, especially at the executive level where a lot of decisions are made that shape the culture of a company can be slow to occur. 
And so, again, I think more than enough evidence that there are issues. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, they're, they're not issues that are quite new. Um, but issues that we do see in other ways. So, can you, can, yes, sorry. Sorry. Can you describe for me? I'm, I'm not too surprised at all of that, but, but I don't know what, what were the issues in the Activision Blizzard lawsuit. What, sure. What did, they, what did the state go after them? Uh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, equal opportunity uh, employment violations. So much the same has happened with Ubisoft and Riot. You had people who were personally engaging in suits in and around hostile work environment. So they were suing because they were being harassed at work. They were suing because they weren't being given opportunities for advancement. Yeah. Wasn't there like some time ago where uh, something blizzard sexual assault? I can't remember if it was blizzard or was something else. I don't know. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Never mind. Don't worry. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, so there, there have been some strange things that studios, including Blizzard, have tried to do. Um, to kind of get information about the player base or to kind of get information about the workforce and supposedly encourage diversity, um, but in ways that were just odd and kind of awkward, um, which I guess kind of fits because as people who are passionate about games, we kind of have a reputation for being awkward. <laughs> <laughs> just being honest. Um, but so much in that same vein, women, people of color, members of the LGBTQIA community who just didn't have the same opportunities, were not made to feel as welcome, who would actually have, you know, acts of harassment perpetrated on them, and, and they were just expected to take it as if it were just a joke, right? And so this led to individual suits being brought, and then the state of California became involved and I looked at it from that angle. So I'm not sure why, like, why Activision Blizzard was a tipping point. Um, but again, I, I think it's, hopefully it's going to lead to positive change. Hopefully it'll lead the studios taking their culture more seriously. So thank you for the question, I appreciate it. So one of the ways that we can see these issues play out in games is in the type of content that we create. And so, from the research side, if you're a person like me who likes research, there have been a couple of studies done that are called virtual censuses that basically look at the top selling 100 games over a year long span and look at the demographic qualities of the characters that are being created. And they look both at characters as a whole as well as what are called player characters. Those are the characters, or what we call avatars, that the player actually gets to portray, that represents them in the world. And so, a couple of folks led by Dimitri Williams and Nian Consalvo in 2009 did this first census. And as you can see, the statistics were not great. Um, so you may or may not be aware that women make up 51% of the population of the planet. <laughs> But they only made up 15% of the population of games, and this was not playable characters, this was total. 15% of the characters that appeared in these games were women. Only 17% were people of color. I think like less than 2% were Latinx or Hispanic, around 8% African American. So here we are, we jump to 2020. <laughs> so, Nia Gonzalo gets another group of researchers together and they're like, we're going to do this again. Surely it's going to be better. 16% of characters were women. 1% uh, yeah. 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 better. Um, people of color made up 20% and then older adult characters, if you notice, they just stayed static. And so older adult here, and if you want to look at it from the scientific perspective, I guess, is anyone over the age of 55. And so, <laughs> yeah, I'm almost there. Some of you are there. It's good. Life is good. <laughs> we just, we aren't in games. And fun fact, although they don't talk about it, um, when older folks are in games, they're either dying, <laughs> the victim of violence, or they're the villain. <laughs> Hooray. Um, so, perhaps not the most fantastic roles. And so, obviously the numbers are pretty abysmal. Um, 
There are parts of our industry where this is better than others. When we get to the future, I'll talk about that a little bit. But overarchingly, what we do see an increase in, which I think is neat, is customization. And so what does that mean if you're not a gamer? Customization means the ability to create a character of your own. And so in some games, it's, it's, ooh, sorry, it's total, right? Like you can change the way they look. You can change the way they function from a gameplay perspective, gender, you know, ethnicity, body build. Like some games, it's really robust. In other games, not so much. There was a game, I can never remember the title of it. It touted, it's like epic customization, the thousands of different character iterations that you could create. And all the characters were dudes. <laughs> no offense to the gentleman in the room, but it was kind of disappointing for me. I was like, please don't brag about how robust your customization is and like ignore every other spectrum of gender. But like, okay. Um, but the, the problem is that as customization has become more common, and say 2019, 2020, about 60% of what we call AA and AAA, which basically just means big budget games, we're offering some form of customization. That's a lot. But unfortunately, as that number goes up, the diversity of player characters goes down. Huh. And so when a, when a game doesn't offer customization, it's actually more likely now that that character will be white, male, heterosexual, and between the ages of 25 and 35. So, I love to see customization go up. I would just also love to see the default not always be a 20-something white guy. Um, case study. So <laughs> if you're a gamer, you probably know this game. If you are not, this is a narratively driven, dramatic game called The Last of Us Part Two, sequel to, surprise, surprise, The Last of Us. And so <laughs> The Last of Us Part Two is a game I decided to talk to you about for a few minutes because it is the first time that a AAA, so the highest price point, what we call like a blockbuster film level budget, right? Um, the first time ever that your preset, so non-customizable player character is a lesbian. No. It's 20 18-ish when this came out, maybe 2019-ish, um, was the first time ever that your pre-designed player character, not one you created by customizing it, was actually a lesbian. And so you can imagine that the audience response was mixed. This character's name is Ellie. She's a character in the original game. You actually protect her for most of the first game. She's a, a young teenager. And you do, for a very small moment, get to play as her. But her nature as a, a queer woman doesn't really become apparent until pretty close to the end of the game. And then there's what they call DLC. It's like um, an extra piece of content they released later that allows you to explore Ellie's first relationship. And so, although Ellie was a character, so broadly, that was liked, having to play her made some folks vocally uncomfortable, let's put it that way. You don't just play as Ellie in The Last of Us Part Two, and I'm sorry for spoilers for anyone who hasn't played the game yet. <laughs> it's been out for a few years, so please forgive me. So half of the game you play as Ellie, and the other half you play as a character named Abby, who is her enemy. <laughs> so if you're a literary person, she's like the deuteragonist, right? So. She's an antagonist, but she's kind of another protagonist. And so Abby is a heterosexual woman. I guess to give you a little context to this world, The Last of Us is centered around an apocalyptic event where an infection causes people basically to go mad and become kind of monstrous. They're not zombies. <laughs> They're mushroom people. <laughs> it sounds way cooler than I'm making it. So, <laughs> fun fact, there's a real world fungus that hijacks the brains of invertebrates. Cordyceps. The cordyceps. And it jumps to people. And so there's an apocalypse. And so the world falls apart. It's very dangerous, dilapidated. So there are diseased humans everywhere, but also just people behaving terribly because 
they're all competing for very limited resources. And so in this dangerous world, you might expect people to be kind of fit, right? Like, if you're going to survive, you probably have to have gotten in a certain degree of shape, be able to take care of yourself. And so Abby is a very hypermuscular woman, which immediately brought out all the trolls oh, who didn't see her as a realistic female character, who wondered if she was really a, a guy pretending to be a woman, right? So there's like all this transphobic nonsense that happened and all this just very, again, sort of vitriolic stuff that happened. And so, you know, the game still did really well, which is a positive, right? So the company who made this game, Naughty Dog, still, you know, recouped their costs and it won a Game of the Year award. It was very well received. But I will say, the there's no better word for it, the toxicity of response. It's so disheartening for the people that are making these works of art. There are people who are, are literally leaving the game industry because they're, they're so defeated by just the, the attacks that they come under at times. So it's, it's unfortunate that even when we do take this step forward, right? Because I mean, I see this as a pretty big leap. Um, it's not always received very well. So, where are we at in the workforce of the industry? You can see, again, not a, probably a huge shocker, that uh, it's not terribly diverse. So the majority of folks who work in the industry report being white, cisgender, heterosexual men. Um, the number of women has actually increased a little bit over the last decade, not enormously, probably around 5%. The number of people of color has held right about the same for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, it's not limited to games. STEM-related fields generally, science, technology, engineering, and math fields generally really struggle to bring in women, people of color, and queer people, just sort of broadly. And so, unfortunately, it seems to be a reality for us as well. And I think that shows in the kind of content we create. And so, unfortunately, you know, I think until we do a better job of, of evening some of these numbers, unless we have allies who are advocating for a better approach, we're likely not going to see an enormous change in the content that we create either. So in terms of age, um, you can see here that only 9% of the people that work in games are over the age of 50. And this is actually an increase. A couple years ago, it was 2%. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm, I'm getting pretty close to 50 myself. I grew up with games. A lot of the people who started the industry are just like 10 to 15 years older than me. And a lot of them did not stay, like clearly, right? Like they didn't all die. Like a lot of them just left. And so I think, you know, for a variety of reasons, but it leaves us in a situation where, you know, a lot of the biases around hiring people that are older in tech have kind of bled over into what we do as well. And so it can be challenging when you're someone who's been in the industry for 15 years or more to get studios to want to take a chance on you. Mm -hmm. They think you're not gonna wanna print the same number of hours. They think you're not keeping up with the latest and greatest tech. They think that you're not basically gonna be willing you know, to, to give of yourself as much as somebody under might, and that you're honestly gonna to be too expensive. So again, it's something we recognize. I wish more people were talking about it. There aren't enough people taking it seriously because my generation who grew up with games, not only playing them but making them, hopefully we're not just going to start dropping off the map here in the next, you know, say five to ten years. You can see in terms of sexuality and gender, again, very small numbers in terms of presence of the LGBTQIA plus community. And so I will say on the positive side, 
but there are a lot of diversity initiatives happening in our industry. Our biggest conference is a game developers conference. It happens every year in San Francisco. There's always a talk on diversity. <coughs> Many of the mid-sized to large studios recruit purposefully for diversity and even sponsor scholarships and internships specifically for people from diverse backgrounds who are studying the subject. Despite that, it, again, it just doesn't seem to be leading to a huge net change in the content of the workforce. How about our audience? So our audience, as you can see, is, is a pretty darn diverse, darn diverse one. So people of all ages play games. I always like to point out to my students that there are more people over the age of 45 playing games than under the age of 18. <laughs> and so I always get this like big eyed look. They're like, really? <laughs> I mean, I have a big white streak. How old do you think I am? Like, I didn't pay someone to do this. It happened naturally. We still play games, right? And so just getting them to, to think a little bit differently. Hopefully part of the change that we'll see. As you can see, gender's nearly a 50-50 split. This has been true for about 20 years. And so women have always played games. Um, it's just perhaps not always the same types of games as, as men might be playing, but there's definitely a diverse audience there. And then as you can see, in terms of sexuality and ethnicity, quite a bit of diversity. I always like to point out with ethnicity particularly that even though numbers may look small for Latinx and black players and, and Asian players, they actually, that demographic group plays more hours per week. They also purchase more games per year. So they're actually a more loyal and more profitable portion of the audience. But we don't create games in reflection of that at all. I guess worth mentioning, you know, as we're talking about the impact of media, even when we do have people of color represented in games, if we go back to the virtual census I mentioned a little bit ago, that the portrayal of those characters is often not very positive. When you look at black characters particularly, and again, remember 2009 to 2020, in these high budget games, 100% of the time for black characters, their backstory is related to either music, sports, or crime. Hmm. And so that in and of itself, right, does harm. When we want to, when we want to see ourselves portrayed in media, we don't always want to see ourselves portrayed stereotypically, right? We want the same kind of varied, nuanced, diverse body portrayals that other demographics get to have. So again, hopefully that's something that we'll see change. So in terms of where people are playing, and, and that's my question at the beginning here, some of you probably play a lot of games on your phone and you don't even think about how often you just pull your phone out and you're like, do, 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 work with friends, right? Um, so a lot of people play on smartphones these days. It's very convenient, right, just to pull your phone out of your pocket and play a game. We also have a significant numbers of players who play on console. And so uh, the PlayStation or the Xbox or the Nintendo Switch. And then a, a pretty sizable audience playing on personal computer. I will say, there's a bit of an age skew here. So folks who are, for example, over the age of 45, more likely to play perhaps on PC or smartphone than on console. And so, again, different platforms, different styles of games, but all valid audiences that we can perhaps do a better job creating content for. So here's a little bit more information on genre and age, and if you're not familiar with game genres, arcade games and action games and shooters tend to be very reflex driven. Puzzle games, obviously, tend to be more mentally challenging. Skill and chance games are often gambling games, and so are games that have some kind of gambling based element to them. And so there's an interesting variety, for sure, but probably not surprising then as folks get older, they begin to lean more on the, the mentally challenging things than the physically challenging things because there's just natural reflex decline that happens, for example, that might make the really reflex intensive stuff more frustrating or just 
fatiguing or even painful over time. I know for me, if you're a Switch fan, you have these little teeny tiny controllers called Joy-Cons, mm -hmm. and holding one of those suckers and trying to play a game, my <laughs> hands just start to hurt after a while. I'm like, my joints hurt. <laughs> well, I mean, like, snap, crackle, pop, right? My, my joints aren't meant for this anymore. So, um, a little bit of history. So, kind of hopefully giving you a pretty good sense of where we are now. How did we get there, right? Or how did we get here? And so, these diversity issues in, in terms of percentages that really have existed since the start, and I think that you can tie this to broader social tendencies in terms of access to technology, right? So if you don't know a ton about the history of the game industry, that's okay, you don't need to, but when you look at its roots, it really starts with computer science, right? And so you have computer scientists who frankly were working on mainframe computers that should have been calculating artillery ranges for like battles and stuff, which is kind of scary. They were tinkering around with those and making little things like tic-tac-toe or a tennis game, and they were like showing it off to their buddies in the lab. There was just a hobby. It was people just trying to test the limits of tech. But the people that had access to that were affluent white men, right? When we're looking at the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, this was not a time period when women and people of color typically got any kind of access to that sort of technology. <coughs> so that bled over, obviously, into the beginnings of the industry. The people who started the arcade era, you may remember arcades, right? And so, you know, if you're flashing the Pong or Pac-Man or Frogger, you know, pick your favorite, I'm a Donkey Kong gal, right? <laughs> These games were made by groups typically of young guys who had left computer science programs and were trying to make a business out of what had been their hobby. Right? Packaging these games into cabinets and trying to sell them to different businesses. And so again, it was just not a space where many women and, and people of color had a chance to get their foot in the door. But there were some, and I'd, I'd like to talk about a few of them. So, we are going to talk about these folks just for a second. So, um, we'll have a little slide on each one. But so, in this group, um, we have several women, we have a few people of color who were really influential in the early days of our industry. And unfortunately, of the ones that you see here, only one is still making games or involved in games development. Others maybe have passed on, but even before they did, they had left the industry. So we'll start with Jerry Lawson. So if you, like me, are a game history nerd, you know one of the really important advancements on consoles was a cartridge. So consoles used to come with all their games packaged in them. Mm -hmm. So the first console was called the Odyssey, <laughs> and it was this beautiful 70s machine that came with static clings you had to put on your TV, so you could actually play the, the games it came with. It was basically just moving like a pixel around on the screen. And so there was a football skin and a soccer skin, and it was all just to make you think this thing had multiple games in it. The technology at the time was really limited, and because the hardware came with all the games packaged in, Jerry Lawson worked on a wildly unsuccessful console called the Fairchild, and he came up with this idea, what if we packaged games separately from the hardware, and he invented the cartridge, and that really changed everything. Um, it allowed some studios to just focus on game development and not worry about hardware, so we had third-party studios spring up right away. And it allowed us to keep a console alive longer because we could continually create new content for it versus having to come out with new consoles all the time. And so he was a really important guy. He used to hang out with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. He was really, in terms of the US, the key figure who was black in the history of games. And unfortunately, even though he was so important, even though his design of the cartridge was basically cloned by every other console creator of that time period. It didn't hope, open huge doors of opportunity for him. Um, and he didn't end up staying in the game industry for very long after his invention. So this is Roberta Williams. And I mentioned with one person who's still involved in making games, and Roberta Williams is that person. So Roberta Williams and her husband began a studio that's now known as Sierra. Um, they were the ones who took 
what used to be just text-based adventure games, kind of narrative exploration games like Zork or Colossal Cave Adventure, and started adding imagery to them. And it was really simple 2D stuff at first, really like ASCII art games. But it was a revolution for the time period. And she really was the first woman as a game designer who we saw having a big influence on the way that games were made. And so Sierra's still in business. They're still making games. She's still involved in that process. Um, I don't know if there's any other woman that can claim to have been a part of the industry as long as she has. Donna Bailey made my favorite arcade game of all time, which is Centipede. <laughs> yeah, Centipede people. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, it had a big trackball in the middle of it, like, a, like a, almost like a cue ball from a pool table. It was just a totally different type of game. Um, I'm short on time or I would wax a little poetic about Centipede, but it was very important for the time period because it did some things technologically in terms of multiple levels and variety of environmental design that games really hadn't done before. Donna Bailey left the industry and she was real blunt about it. She was like, couldn't put up with the frat house anymore. And so, like a lot of women who worked in the early days of the industry, guess what? She didn't feel welcome. The workplace was hostile. She didn't have an opportunity for advancement. It's the same stuff that in 2019 to 2020, all these big studios are finally getting sued for, or happening right from the start. And so, she worked with Atari, which was one of the huge names of the time period, and then moved on to Activision. And after that, she just left the industry altogether. She went on to teach, um, and also to care for her parents. We could talk about the roles of women and how that limits our access to working in tech fields, but that is a different, but very interesting talk. So, we all know. This is Carol Shaw. So Carol Shaw was another female game designer. She created a vertically scrolling shooter called River Raid. She did this at a time period when Activision, the studio she worked for, did profit sharing. River Raid made so much money that she was like, peace, I'm out. <laughs> 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 Carol. And so, yeah, she literally made so much money. She was like, I don't have to put up with this anymore. I'm going to go. And so she left the industry in the 80s, never to return. I hope she's happy and doing well. But for us, I feel like, you know, a pang of loss, because what other great games might she have made? If the industry would let her, if, if the industry would yeah. give any more opportunity or be less of a frat house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so this is Muriel Tramis, and Muriel Tramis, at least as, as far as my research has shown, is the first black woman to create games. And so she worked for a studio in France on adventure games, again, sort of narratively driven, puzzle focused games. Her most well-known product is called Movilo, which sadly she tried to kickstart a reboot of in 2018 and it didn't go through. I was bummed about that. I would have loved it. But so again, so these, these people have existed in our industry and have been a part of our industry from the start. The problem is we don't see this perhaps same, how would I put it, duration in the industry as other demographics have shown. And then CM Ralph is actually a developer I just learned about a year ago, which is kind of crazy for me as a queer woman. I had no idea CM Ralph was a lesbian who made a video game way back in 1989. Not only was she a lesbian making games, but she made a game about a lesbian character. And so before Ellie, we had, for better or worse, Tracker McDyke. <laughs> 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 Subtle is the watchword. <laughs> I'll forgive her because it was 1989. And so <laughs> she created a game called Caper and the Castro that not only featured a lesbian protagonist, but also featured the first transgender character. And so she was a detective actually investigating the disappearance of her friend, who was a trans woman. And again, classic point and click adventure game. I was super psyched to find out this existed, and even more excited to find out that it had actually been preserved and emulated. So you can actually go online and play Caper and the Castro. 
I'm not saying it's the best point of adventure game you're ever going to play. It was this lovely little piece of, of LGBTQIA history in our industry. It was also created specifically to raise money for her friends who were struggling with HIV and AIDS. And so it was released as charity wear. She didn't make any money from the game at all. Everything she made, she gave to the Castro community in San Francisco because of basically how it opened up her life, which I think is a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And so, again, just a little snapshot. There are, even now, lots of people who are not, you know, 25 to 30 year old, straight, heterosexual, uh, cisgender white guys. There are, there are lots of diverse people. The key, I think, is how supported are they in the creation of their product, and getting their product out to audiences so that it can actually be seen? Are they being welcomed into mid-sized and larger studios so they can help to transform the way those studios work? I think that it's getting better, but I think we could be doing more to support those diverse parts of our community. So that brings us to the future. And so where do I see things going from here? Where do I see maybe the most potential for positive change coming from. And for me, there's a couple of different routes. Number one is the Games for Change movement. So if you're not aware of the Games for Change movement, it's an area of our industry that is specifically focused on creating games that aren't just entertainment. Games that are meant to transform the way you think. Games that are meant to open your eyes to different social ills or environmental concerns. And so they're games made with a purpose of making us better, really, than, than we might be before. Games for Change has a conference that happens every year. There are awards that they give out for games. And so if you are interested, perhaps, in playing games of a type you wouldn't have before, but games that are, again, about something more than just, you know, blowing somebody up or shooting them with a gun, Games for Change products are a great route to find that kind of work. We also have a really thriving independent or what we call indie game industry. There are lots of people who are creating small budget, small scale passion projects, releasing games all over the place. Now, are they getting the big budget? Are they doing the big you know, marketing pushes? Are they releasing disc versions of their games in Target and Walmart and Best Buy? Probably not. They're thriving because there are virtual marketplaces that exist. So they're releasing on Steam, they're releasing on itch.io, they're working with virtual marketplaces on the major consoles, and they're releasing their product there. These indie games, I mean, some of them are just as, you know, octane-focused, entertainment-driven products as you get at the, the big budget level. But a lot of them are trying to do something more, and a lot of them are being created by people who did not feel at home for whatever reason in the larger part of our industry. And so this is where you find a lot of diversity in terms of age, ethnicity, gender, sexuality. So our audience is also changing. As I mentioned, it's not just kids <laughs> under the age of 18 that are playing games. Our audience is way more diverse than that. Games have become so pervasive that more than 88% of Americans report that they play games at least once a month. That's a lot. <laughs> so there are a lot of people who play a variety of types of games. I think we just, as an industry, could do a better job making sure that we are releasing content that interests as many people as possible and that can be, again, compelling and impactful to as many people as possible. And that's perhaps where we're still growing. Another thing I wanted to point out is the phenomenon of what's called mixed reality. So how many of you have ever played around in VR or you know, maybe played around with an Oculus or oh, so for you. Awesome, awesome. So maybe you've never done anything with virtual reality, you know, maybe you've never had a chance to try a HoloLens or a Magic Leap. Let me ask this. How many of you play Pokemon Go? Only oh, one? Two? Okay. I haven't played in a while. <laughs> if I had asked that question four years ago, it probably would have been a very different answer. So that's what's called an augmented reality experience, right? Where I can set my game so that if I scan around with my phone, I see little Pokemon popping up in the world, right? All of that is mixed reality, or what's called XR. That part of our industry 
interestingly, is not as new as everyone thinks. <laughs> Mixed reality has really been around since the, the 50s and 60s. It's just that the technology has gotten so good and the costs have dropped so much that a lot more people can experience it than could before. And so it's much more in our consciousness than it was before. And this, we'll call it an iteration, I guess, this iteration of the mixed reality industry from the very start has been focused on diversity, building up from a diverse foundation. And so you get things like Oculus Launchpad, where they pick 100 people from diverse backgrounds and they fly them out to Facebook headquarters and they train them on VR and 360 film. And it happens every year. And so that's very encouraging to me that as this new avenue of our industry gains in popularity, it's really one of the places where you see more women, more people of color, more queer people, probably than any other part of our industry, who are part of the products that are being made. Bonus unlocked. We have time. We <laughs> <laughs> made it. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Um, <laughs> I wanted to recommend some games, um, so feel free to take a picture if you want. Um, these are games that are indie products. Several of them I would consider games for change products, but are just not your typical game. Um, there's no running or gunning here. Assemble with care puts you in the role of a young woman who travels around fixing broken things for people. It's a really lovely, calm puzzle game with a beautiful story. Dream Daddy is a fabulously queer game where you're helping your character find a guy to woo. It is hilarious. <laughs> Florence is a beautiful, poetic story of a woman's first love, explored via puzzles. It's like a goosebumps, so, so nice. Gone Home tells the story of a woman who's traveled abroad for a year and comes home, her family actually moved while she was gone, comes home to find the house empty. She has to piece together what's happened to her family while she's been away. It's very beautiful. Uh, Life is Strange is, again, fabulously queer, um, a very interesting sort of supernatural tale, um, very puzzle and narratively driven. And then Nyakazine is a really lovely game that lets you garden with some magical music. I've never played anything like it before. But if you love music and you love plants and you don't mind the mutants, they're friendly. <laughs> they're, they're cute. Then you might enjoy that one. Uh, Sky the Children of Light is a game that you can get for free on your phone. It's a multiplayer game where you help each other. It's a beautiful world but with lovely music. It's actually my favorite studio. They're called That Game Company. Um, I would say it's a spiritual successor to a gorgeous game called Journey, which is a lovely little manifestation of Joseph Campbell's hero cycle in the best possible way. Um, but Sky the Children of Light, it's, it's all about bolstering one another, lifting one another up uh, in a very serene world. Goodness knows we could use more of that today. <laughs> Spirit Bearer is, my goodness, um, a little overclimbed. It is a game that puts you in the role of the ferryman of death and the beautiful relationship that you develop with souls who are going on to their next phase. Um, I don't write to developers often. When I do, it's because they did something really special. And I wrote to them and thanked them for a spirit named Alice who's a lovely little hedgehog who's lost her memory. And if you know me, you know my mom passed away from Alzheimer's. Um, it was literally like getting to play through caring for her again. And it was lovely and very cathartic for me. And so when I say a game that isn't just a game, but a game that can transform you, Spirit Fair did that for me. So it meant a lot. The Stillness of the Wind is a poem of a game. You're a, an old woman named Talma in a landscape being consumed by desert, tending to a little farm, feeding your goats, watering your plants. Um, it's a little melancholy, but it's nice. And Tell Me Why, from the same studio that made Life is Strange, is the beautiful story of a young trans man um, and the relationships in his life. 
And so there is a really a lot of powerful art being created in this industry. It's a part of why I love this industry. But I hope that we will continue to strive to do better. So if you would like to learn more, these are some resources you can check out. The ESA Essentials is a stats document that our industry, um, through the Entertainment Software Association, puts out every year. Let you know about player demographics and about sales information. Gaming attitudes and habits of adults over the age of 50 is a, say what you want about them, but is an amazing report that the AARP does on <laughs> video game habits. <laughs> Fun fact, in 2016, People over the age of 50 spent $513 million in a year on games. In 2019, it was over $3 billion. <laughs> and so that audience is, is just growing, and, and hopefully our industry will take note. Feminist Frequency is a phenomenal series analyzing games through a feminist viewpoint. I always like to give them some extra love because they were one of the groups that was really targeted during Gamergate, Anita Sarkeesian, among others actually had to hire a private security and leave her home because of the threats to her life. The Ultimate History of Video Games is just a great book if you're interested in, in kind of the hobby to multi-billion dollar uh, trajectory of this, uh, this particular field. And then Gaming Magazine is a indie queer focused magazine that talks about games and other pop culture. So, Lots of good resources out there. Um, thank you all so much, and I'd be happy to take questions. So feel free to call on folks. We'll go one at a time. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes, whatever you need. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, the statistics, were those just in the US or were those worldwide? Really great question. So the Entertainment Software Association looks at anything rated through their uh, rating system, which is called the ESRB, the Entertainment Software Rating Board. That's over the US, Canada, and Mexico. So those are where those numbers came from. Thank you. Yes? I think it was clear um, when we found out what you were talking about, but when somebody asked us, what kind of gaming do you mean, the, um, you know, like, um, gambling gaming came up. So I know there's a lot of graphics in there. Those are probably much more simpler mathematic games, but is there any overlap between the two industries, regardless or not of the diversity issues that you're talking about? I think that's a great question. So I, I will say from my perspective, the design of gambling games, it's really dependent upon what part of it you're talking about. So most gambling games these days, if you're somebody who goes off to casinos and, and plays slots, for example, have games within games. Right? So there's not just you're pulling the bar, but there's a game that you're playing in between to keep you engaged and to keep you entertained. Folks from, who are trained to be game designers would be making like those games within the game. The person who is at the gambling company designing the gambling portion and the payouts and the percentages there is probably a PhD in mathematics. So it's a very specialized mm -hmm. role. But there's definitely some overlap. Here first. Thank you. That's a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so you were talking about PhD in mathematics. What is the educational qualification of skills needed to be a successful game developer? That's a two-part question. That's part one. And then part two is how do we I mean it seems like those skills are perhaps not very well distributed uh, in the at least in this country. Yeah. I, both great questions. So on the educational side and, and how that connects to the roles we need, people, uh, games are made by artists, so 2D or 3D artists, people who do animation, who do texturing, shading and lighting, um, modeling. You have programmers, right, so people who are coding. You have designers who are the people who are crafting what are the mechanics of the game or the rules of the game and the gameplay structure. Um, people who do testing, people who do production, which is basically project management, or I love to call it cat herding. And so <laughs> wrangling all these different creatives and trying to get us to work together nicely and speak each other's language and actually get something done. So actually a really diverse body of skill sets. I mean, we, we clearly need HR people, right? 
<laughs> like we, you know, we need people who do marketing and, and who do um, business relationship because we're working with publishers. So there's really an enormous number of skill sets you could bring to bear. Um, but they tend toward a dependency on technology, right? And so I think until we address some of the broader inequalities that exist in that access to tech, it's going to be challenging to improve the, the situation in the industry. I don't know if that addressed part one and part two or just part one. It, it does. I mean, but part two was where it is. It also is amazing. Sorry if I'm making a comment. Uh, that every young person I talk to, either they love math, which would be like 5%, and 95% just are afraid of math. <laughs> so if they're afraid of math, what's our... Well, and, and even for me, you know, it's like game design is math. <laughs> what we do is rules that are driven by variables, and so I have to, like, and I teach graduate students, I still have to tell them, it's okay, don't be afraid, it's just math is as hard as you make it, right? You get to make the design decisions that will shape how complicated the mathematics are that drive your product, and so if you're afraid of math, here are some kinds of games you might want to focus on for your work. <laughs> You know, and so if I see somebody who's like, we're going to have this incredible procedural generation system, and I'm like, do you know how to design those algorithms? Because like, if not, no, you aren't. <laughs> like, you can't just say, I'm going to have these cool things, because you have to actually be able to explain how they're going to work. So I agree with you. That, that comfort <laughs> is really important. Uh, the question I had kind of brought together a couple different um, stats you had there. So... As the age group went up, a lot of things went into the, the skill and chance, and that in the last uh, few years, the amount of money of older people spent on gaming went up. Now, if that includes the gambling aspect of things, and if that could actually point more towards some problems as well, not just that they're spending more, that what they're spending it on and what that means, if that's all part of those statistics. I get you. So, I think part of the reason we are seeing the change in profitability is who counts as 50 and, and older, right? And so I had my area of focus in, in gaming and my research has always been diversity and accessibility. So getting games appropriate to as many audiences as possible. Accessibility is basically looking at creating content that regardless of a, a physiological barrier or a cognitive barrier, you can still play games, right? Those have converged for me in the past five years to looking at what's called gerontoludic design, which is the design of games for older adults. Because I realized I'm almost them. <laughs> but quite frankly, it was very selfish of me at first. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> They're saying anywhere between 50 to 55 is older adult. I'm like three and a half years away from that now. And so then I was like, I'm a pretty young, like on the cusp of millennial Gen Xer. And I was like, wait, how old are the oldest Gen Xers now? And I was like, well, they're already older adults. The oldest Gen Xers are 57 or 58 this year. And so those people are all playing games. They've been playing games. And so I think the profitability of the older adult audience is just going to continue to rise every year. Because you have people who, for them, games have always been a foundational hobby. Now the other half of your question, what are they spending money on? So the addictive potential of games is well documented enough that as of the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual 5, which is a American Psychological Association's diagnostic manual for various mental health conditions, that as of the fifth version of that, gaming addiction is officially a, a condition that people can be diagnosed with. So are there studios who purposefully use an understanding of human psychology, variable reward schedules, and all of that to prompt addictive patterns of play? Yes. Do I personally ethically think that is right? Absolutely not. And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of legislation around it, depending on how you come at chance, right? Because there are lots of things that we do that are chance-based that might prompt people to spend more money than they have, especially on the free-to-play side games, free-to-play. Um, <laughs> that unfortunately, at least yet, 
don't have a lot of regulation around them. So I agree. I share that concern. For those people that haven't fallen victim to the free-to-play, can you brief us on that? Oh, absolutely. So free-to-play games are a phenomenon that arose out of Asia, predominantly China, and spread over into Europe and the US, probably beginning around 2004 to 2006. Um, these are games that are ostensibly free, but to actually access all of the content or the top tier content or in competitive games to be competitive, they require you to play. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes there's an energy pool or skins or something that you're, you're investing money for. And unfortunately, with the way that a lot of these games are designed, because they're on your phone, right? How many of us have got our credit card just hooked into an app store? <laughs> and so when they're like, you should pay 99 cents for coins, Robin, coins, because you need more space in your Pokedex to collect Pokemon. <laughs> I'm like, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Wait, how many real world bucks did I just spend here for digital storage for my digital Pokemon? <laughs> more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> I've spent a lot of money on Pokemon Go. And, and that one, honestly, probably one of the least predatory um, of the, of the free-to-play games out there because you really can do everything that you need to do in that without investing a whole lot of money. Yeah. Gotcha games. Gotcha games are another great example, right? Where, again, there's a, a randomness and reward and you're paying for access to have another chance, have another chance, have another chance. Mm -hmm. Even large budget AAA games, seeing the success of free-to-play games, have been building these kinds of strategies into their products to the point in some cases where states have even, and, and in Europe, some countries have gone, wait, this is gambling now, like mm -hmm. we have to adjust how you're doing this. Otherwise, you're going to come under that legislation. So it's, there's a lot that's kind of up in the air in that regard right now. Yes. Um, you had mentioned Leap Magic out of South Florida. Are you familiar with Leap Motion and Ultra Leap as well? Yeah, Mash Leap and Leap Motion. Yeah. And for those of you who are curious about mixed reality, there's a lot of really interesting products. Um, I think it's just a matter of, honestly, my first piece of advice to you would be, before you invest a lot of time and money, find out how bad your visually induced motion sickness is. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robin, and my friends in the Sim Biz department call me the canary in the mine shaft. <laughs> because if a simulation is going to make people sick, I'd be able to tell them in about two minutes because I get sick. And so the terrible thing about simulation sickness is that once you start feeling nauseous, that will actually get worse for the next two to three hours before you start to feel better. Mm -hmm. So once you feel even a little sick, mm -hmm. you're sick. <laughs> like, I can't even play first person games that are really action oriented because my, my visual induced motion sickness is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool tech out there and it is getting less expensive, but I would, I would try to find that out first. <laughs> I only mentioned Leap Motion and Ultra Leap because that's my nephew. Oh, nice. And I think one of the, again, that's a teacher and a researcher in me, one of the things that really interests me about mixed reality, especially virtual reality, we're getting very good at tricking the brain into thinking that something's real, which is fascinating, but also scares me a little bit because we don't necessarily understand all the long-term implications of that. I don't ever want to do harm with my work. And so sometimes I worry, like, it is possible to scare someone too much, right? And so th there's a lot of good that's being done. Uh, actually, a lot of research around VR is actually on the therapeutic potential of VR. It's being used to treat people with PTSD. Mm -hmm. It's being used for exposure therapy for people with phobias. And so there's a lot of really positive work that's being done. On the flip side of that, is it possible potentially for entertainment to do harm? Maybe. So. Again, lots of research being done, but a very interesting part of our field. Yes? I just wanted to say, what an incredible asset that you are for Full Sail and for the gaming community. You're just a great public speaker. It was so interesting, and I really appreciated you being here. Seriously. Thank you.
appreciate that very much. You had a question. Yeah. Very early in the, in the presentation, and that for me, I have trouble recalling, but uh, there, was, there, there was a suggestion of building games that would, uh, would kind of affect people's thinking or like to in, in, increase their, their morality or something like that. And, and I wonder if that, for me, that sounds scary mm. because it's, it's that can, you know, the, you're going to have the good guys and you're going to have the bad guys. So yeah. uh, and I wonder how, is there any kind of uh, uh, watchers or? This is a really important question because just like I was talking about with VR, right? Anything you can use for good, you can use to corrupt. <clears throat> Games as propaganda tool, mm -hmm. there's some terrifying things that have been done around the world. And, and e even you know, if you look at issues like white supremacy, organizations that are making products that espouse those ideologies and trying to get them into the hands of young people. So you're absolutely right. And the, the watching part, um, in our industry, everything is voluntary. So we don't have any legally enforced rating system in the United States for games. All of our organizations are voluntary. That goes back to 1994 when we were threatened with legislation. And as an industry, we were like, no, no, we can do a better job rating our games. And that's when the ESA was created and established the ESRB. But in other countries, there are legally enforced systems where the review of games is perhaps more strict. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think about like the European Union falls under a, a organization called PEGI, which is an acronym, but for interest of time, I'll just say PEGI. PEGI is legally enforced in some countries, it's voluntarily enforced in others. Countries like Germany and Australia have a reputation for being very strict, very, um, very precise in their screening. So they often will play games from start to finish before rating them. In a lot of other regions, including the US, we play a portion of a game, and then the developer gets to report on the rest and tell you what content's there. But some of the platforms that exist digitally to release games don't even require you to get a rating. So there's absolutely stuff out there that, that is slipping through the cracks. Yes? Are you aware of any, I guess, studies of the audience that would ask the question whether there were barriers such as like internalized um, misogyny or racism that would drive the audience to not want to play characters that portray themselves? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So my answer is I bet there is. I'm trying to think of a particular study to point you toward. Um, there's a lot of a lot of the research I've been doing over the last five years specifically has been looking at the way older adults are depicted in media and the internalized ageism that we bring. So I, I did a study um, just last year and found that a majority of my respondents, because I was specifically targeting people over the age of 50, felt more comfortable playing a younger character. And so I do think part of that is internalized ageism because of how media depicts aging as decline versus being able to be thriving and vital. And so, yeah, I agree. That's, that's definitely an issue. I'm sure that affects issues on, on gender lines, sexuality lines, and ethnicity as well as age. Other questions? Yes? <coughs> when you were talking about the lawsuits, there was a company that um, requires their uh, potential employees to have to be good at their games. Does that apply just to the creative people or like the finance people as well? <laughs> it was everybody. It, uh, I'll be honest, like, it was something I was going to talk to you all about anyway, but my students brought it up in class. And, boys. and I had like one guy that was like, it's gatekeeping, and he was so angry about it. And then another guy was like, well, I can kind of see their point. Like, 
you want to know that people you hire are passionate about your product. And I was like, so you're telling me I get the most tremendous artist. They can do the most beautiful work. Mm -hmm. Their models are like anything I've ever seen before, and I know they're going to make my product better. And they're just bad at my game. It wasn't just that they required people to put in a certain number of hours. You had to have hit a certain level of, of, again, proficiency or being good. So they got 300 hours into my game, and it's clear they're terrible at it. <laughs> huh. But they love it, and they're an amazing artist. I want to hire them, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to go like, oh, sorry, get good. Like, but that's what's happening, basically. And so, yeah, just, honestly, like, it's so juvenile. Like, it makes me clear, like, I get frustrated about it, because I'm just like, it's like the worst cliche of, of our industry. Like, please do better. Like, culture is a hard thing for any company to manage. But you can go all the way back to the start of the industry. Remember, we were talking about the frat house, right? A lot of studios are still begun that way. They're still started by a group of people who went to school with each other, who liked working together, and they decide they're going to go off and start a studio. And that's exactly what happened with Riot. A bunch of kids that just happened to make a game that took off, that people fell in love with, and it's let them grow really big without an understanding of how to run a business. And so now they're, they're having to learn how to actually create a positive culture. And that internal issue within their company absolutely had an impact upon their audience, right? I mean, League is noted as being one of the most toxic cultures for an, an online massive multiplayer game. They have put hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to solve these problems. They have a whole team of PhDs whose job is to try to reduce toxicity <laughs> in their audience. <laughs> But part of it is reducing toxicity in their company, which they're working on. Again, credit where credit is due, they're working on it. I just wish it hadn't come as a result of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. what, what, are the, what are the top few, just two or three uh, companies that make games, and uh, and what is the best upcoming company? Do you oh think? Oh goodness. Um, I mean, if we're looking at sort of like. Best in terms of biggest and most profitable. That's what I meant. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, Electronic Riot, Arts or Riot, Ubisoft, and, and Activision Blizzard are three of the most successful companies in the world. Um, Electronic Arts is a hugely successful organization. You have studios like uh, Sony, um, as well as other smaller but really successful companies like Valve and Naughty Dog. Like, there's there's many. Um, in terms of up and coming. Um, I'll, I'll give a vote for Don't Nod. Don't Nod is the company who made Life is Strange and Tell Me Why. I love a clucky little indie that could. <laughs> so they've had a lot of success with their products and a lot of really positive response for the diversity they're trying to explore in their products. So give them a try. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you.